Fast and efficient software is great. But without control, speed kills. Security provides the guidance systems. It lowers risk, increases reliability. I'm looking for the ones who know about security. The ones who advocate speed with control. These are the security champions. Hey, welcome to another episode of The Security Champions. I'm Scott Moore, your host. Thanks for watching. You know, many companies use a security information and event management system to help them detect security issues well before it impacts their business. And when Gartner first introduced this, it revolutionized the way IT approached security. But today's IT isn't the same today as it was in the early 2000s. It's been about 15 years and many companies are struggling with their SIM dashboards because of an ever-increasing amount of data, network traffic, attacks, and the events that are triggered from those attacks. So what's the answer? Is the SIM as we know it dead? Our guest today seems to think so, and that's what we're gonna talk about on today's show. Chris, welcome to Security Champions. So good to have you on today. Awesome to be here. Awesome. So. I want to talk to you about you and your company, Fluency Security. So I'd like for you to kind of introduce yourself and what's your background with security? So background-wise, uh, I started security in the early 90s, um, helped stand up the Army Computer Emergency Response Team. And then I transferred from standing up a bunch of certs for companies like J.P. Morgan, DuPont, and for the government like FAA and DTRA. I switched over into development. 2003, I started doing R&D for the NSA and DHS. That company I sold to McAfee. So I was a VP for McAfee for four years for threat intelligence. And then after that, I started Fluency. Awesome, so you've been around the block a few yeah. times. Okay, so Fluency Security. Um, it's a SIM, but is it a SIM? So we never defined ourselves as being a SIM. We always said we're a data analytics company. When we solve the problem of data analytics in security, you're building a SIM. You're building something for someone to recognize when there is a problem and to help have the visibility to close it. Mm -hmm. And that really is, by definition, what a SIM should be. Okay, but now I've heard you say, and others lately, mm -hmm. the SIM is dead. Dead as a door. Why would you say that? Well, what's happened is, is that we've consistently added to the SIM. We wanted certification, let's add certification reports. We wanted vulnerability data, let's add vulnerability data. Let's do asset management. And pretty soon, we started adding every feature that we wanted to do in the operations into the SIM. And it was no longer focused. And so Gartner in 2022, that was the last magic quadrant they did for SIM. In 2023, they didn't have one. Really? So that's one way we can take a look at it, is that Gartner doesn't see it as a single product anymore. The next one we can take a look at is that people started being more oriented around certifications. Mm -hmm. And so it was, became a checkbox. And if you take a look at the checkboxes, the most recent one being the government CMMC, that's what government contractors have to, to do. And in it, it just says you collect all the data in a central location and you follow these 12 basic requirements for, for handling the data. That has nothing to do in there. There's no vulnerability, no certification stuff. All those other things are gone. And it's because it's a pure play around what do you do with audit? Mm -hmm. How do you handle audit? And what is the value of audit? Which of course is, I need to review my audit to see when there's a violation or to see when there's a problem like, like a compromise or a breach. So what is the biggest problem with the SIM? Is it just that it's, uh, it was a failed model to begin with or just because of all these changes? And, and if that's the case, what's the solution? As we start collecting all this data, it's like Lord of the Flies with the pig. It, we started collecting more and more data. And what's weird about data is that all the data in, in our world that we know about actually doubles every two years. Mm. There's so much processing power and so many things we're learning, so many things we're doing as people that the amount of data we have doubles every two years. And our audit logs show that, right? We're auditing the data we're creating. So our audit logs are growing or doubling every two years. So the SIM that we had even eight years ago is handling only 3% of 
of the problem that it was designed for. In other words, the data has grown so much, if you keep on doubling and doubling, we're actually no longer scaling to how much data we have to pull in. And so the big argument that you see people of this is that I can't handle all the data. So what do you do? Oh, I now route it and I put it into a trash can or I route it and I put it into cold storage without ever looking at it. And so now you have this situation where people can't process the data. And that frustration is, well, I guess I can't use it anymore, right? So the, this idea of what we wanted out of a sim, we can't do. So how do, we, how do we deal with all of this data? Because it sounds to me like that means things are going to get swept under the rug. You're not going to find the problem. And that's, the most, that's why you set this thing up to begin with, is to find security vulnerabilities early and fix it before you get hacked, right? So how are you going to deal with this? That's the big paradigm shift. The big paradigm shift is why are you storing all this data and searching it? What I need to be able to do is evaluate this data and maintain a state of that data independent of the database. And once you focus on what is the problem, you can say, hey, as this data comes in, I can, I can analyze it. Now let's take a step back and say, what's the difference here? Searching versus watching, right? So let's say you're a bouncer at a bar and people come in. If I want to know how, the fire department says, I can't have more than 60 people, how do I handle that? It's very easy. Every time someone walks in, I click my clicker. You got three people in your party, click, 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 let you in. And I can look down. You got five people in your party? I'm at 58. I can't have you five. So I click negatives until I get enough people, and then I say, get in there, click, click, click. Right. That's watching. What all the Sims are doing today is three people come in, next five people, wait a second. You close the door, you look in there, and you say, everybody freeze, <laughs> and I gotta count you all, right? right? And then you say, oh, now how accurate is that count? You go, oh, gotta stop, stop, you can't move, right? Mm -hmm. right? And that's actually just like a database lock. I have to stop the movement of the data so I can count it. Mm. Then I can go back and let those people in. And the next people that come in, I have to do the same thing all over again. So you can see this just is not working. It's not going to scale. It just doesn't scale at all. Okay, Chris, so if, this, if you're the future of the sim, um, explain what that looks like and what, it, what that entails, what the technology behind it. So the sim is not so simple as find a problem and fix it, right? We have to understand that there's different phases to the data. One part is how do I get the data into the system, right? Once it's into the processing of the system, not necessarily the database, okay, then I have to analyze that data. I'm gonna send up two things. One's metrics, one's notifications. Then eventually I am gonna place that data in a database because you're gonna to have to do an investigation one day. You have to analyze it. Now, some people say, oh, I keep it for 30 days. Oh, it's stupid to keep it for 90 days. I'll throw away non-security events after 90 days. What You can go back, just Google it. How long is the average breach detected over year over year? And you're gonna find that the average breach is detected after 200 days of activity, which means if you only keep 90 days, most of the time, <laughs> you've lost the ability to see what happened when the problem really exists. That's the reason why most companies do a full year because it's a bell curve, it's just not guaranteed at 200 days. And it's gonna take another 70 days before you get closure. So 270 days is, is the basic realm of how you wanna be able to keep your data sets, right? With the curve out and 70 days extension. Now, one of the more difficult parts that we're solving is the ability to get the data in. You would think that's solved by now. But what happened was, was that we had written these connectors and added scripts to these connectors without watching them. So they break. The only know we, the way any of these sims know it breaks is, the, where's the data? Oh, it's missing. Oh, we might have a broken path. And then you start investigating it, right? That's not exactly operationally smart, mm -hmm. right? So now what we've done is we've added more, pro not just the processing power to the connector, but the ability to view the processing power in the connector, one being what we call the flow, and the other being the data, or the stream. And so the stream is what we do analysis on, but the flow, we have to make sure it's operationally up, right? So it's, it's not so easy as it seems. It's a very difficult problem to solve, but we've come up with a very elegant solution, a piping solution, that's not just visibility, it's operations. Okay, but I gotta get back to the cost because that's what the sea level is gonna ask about, right? right? So how much more expensive is this to do? So the first thing, when you take a look at cost, 
is you have to understand where does cost come from. So cost comes from I'm grabbing the data and collecting it, so I'm processing it as it comes in or analyzing as it comes in. Most people just parse it. The second one is your data storage. How, just how long am I going to store it? And the type of storage I use, right? Most databases require EBS when you're in the cloud, which is the most expensive. Finally, you have to say, I now have the post-process analysis, right? So now the storage is cold. So the first part is the hot, and the second is the cold storage, mm. okay? And then when I search it, that's a cost. So if you go to Microsoft Sentinel and you say, divide the cost up, you gotta realize that it, the first piece is my ingressing of data, how much data is gonna get ingressed, because that's my analysis process, the storage, and the search. So you can see those three themes with most organizations. And so a lot of it is driven by how much data are you gonna have, all right? So people are trying to reduce cost by trying to reduce their data, but how do you know which data is the right data to remove? Right? because you're storing it. So that's that thing about moving left of the database. If I don't store my data, but I analyze everything, can I store less data? So you can get the data that you need without having to keep it all, so you can actually reduce the cost here. You can throw data away. People estimate you're gonna be able to throw away about 28% of data that's not actually used. And then, like I said, data that's part of metrics is, can be thrown in that also. So Chris, um, I know that sometimes you have had to think outside of the box in terms of the metrics you provide, the rules, the triggers, um, what you've had to do to uh, meet customer needs. But tell me about maybe some interesting ones, things where you've had to be very creative or things that you didn't expect you'd have to do and, and how you dealt with that. One was we had a, a company that had a configuration issue and they had a requirement that says, I have to run uh, the Mandian engine, uh, Sentinel-1 engine, a Qualys engine, and um, I had to, of course, have it in my Active Directory to manage. And so they came back to us and said, hey, we'll, we'll give you the asset list, right? And can you check to make sure we're all compliant? And one thing that's interesting, the reason why this is an interesting problem is that's not audit data, that's configuration data. And in Fluency, we grab both the audit and the configuration data because a lot of times to enhance data, I need to know its configuration. So we happen to have that. It's also an interesting problem because it's an asset management, which is outside the sim box that we talked about earlier. But now you think about it, you say to yourself, okay, isn't that an asset problem? And, and what's interesting is, is that each product had a different view of your network. People all the time think you have assets and that they're static, but they're incredibly flex. In other words, once we did this, they realized, hey, there were systems that had all three agents, but were never in their Active Directory, right. which is kind of interesting. And there were Active Directory systems where systems were missing one or two, or maybe all. There was machines that Active Directory knew about that none of their agents knew about. Hmm. And so it, it generates a very fascinating list because what it comes down to is you begin to realize, hey, I might have somebody who has a home system they're bringing in, and we never realized that wasn't on our asset list, right? You have all these bizarre scenarios where the different opinions of each product generate your understanding of the network. So Chris, you talked a lot about managed service providers and how they have to provide SLAs, but why would a company care about SLAs if they're not using an MSP? That's a good point. I'm, you could be a manager of a bank. We were talking to a bank one time, and they asked the exact question. They said, you just explain things as an SLA, but I'm not gonna outsource it. Why do I care about an SLA? SLAs establish a metric, a goal. If you're running an organization with zero goals, you're running a mob. There's no focus. If you think about like GE's successes in the 90s, they had Six Sigma. They had a structure. They said, here's what we need to do. We have a way to measure it. We're improving our, secure, our, 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 our processes. And they related that and it became profit to them. They realized that when they had very structured objectives and they met those objectives and they improved those objectives, they improved the company and it eventually winds up improving the profit. Right? Now, go back to this bank manager that looks at these SLAs and says, why, why is that important for me? You're securing my money. Okay, first of all, you, I sh you should care a lot about security. You should be able to measure your security. And if you're gonna 
if you just for the fun of it outsourced it, you would care about SLAs. So why do you not measure your own people against what you would have measured another company against? So it's very important to understand that SLAs are a metric to measure performance to make yourself better. If you work out, solid workout, people care how much they lift. They know if they're improving, how many minutes they improve, how many days they go. Peloton riders, they, they look at their schedule and they say, this is my minutes, this is my burns. These are so many performance things that we do to measure ourselves to see, are we getting better? It's the same thing with security. If you're not measuring what you're doing, there's no way in the world to know if you're getting better. So, but there are some who are watching this who say, I get it, and I want to know more about this. How do people actually find out more about this? Well, the easy part is, is website. They can come to our website, fluencysecurity.com. Um, they can check us out on LinkedIn, type in Fluency Security. You can find us on, on LinkedIn. We have a newsletter. Um, and I will say, I've read that newsletter, very interesting stuff, and goes very deep in a lot of this, this subject. I mean, some of it, I, I mean, I've learned a lot from reading this. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting aspect about our LinkedIn uh, image of us, because uh, even though we, we sometimes put stuff out, our main focus is two things about information that comes from our comp company. I'm not really reposting other people. Mm -hmm. I'm not here to be a LinkedIn marketer. Right. Right? right. LinkedIn is a tool by which we release information. And so it's always unique to us. It's unique to the technology and to our research work. And we're just using it as a forum to get that out. So when we bring up the newsletter, you'll notice that there's no, hey, where has Chris and Al been? It's not in there. Right. It literally just goes into technology and says, thank you very much. So if you're into security, but you also want to get deep into the daily analytics and figuring out the, the whys and what fors, this is a way to go. A lot of people ask us, how do you get into the industry? And, and to me, I think the answer is passion. Mm -hmm. You really don't look at this in you, anything in life. If you look at it for money, you're going to do crappy at it. Right. Look at this and say, do you find this interesting? I find this fascinating. Well, thanks so much for being on the Security Champions. Yeah. Appreciate it, Chris. Come back anytime. While the big sim players probably aren't going anywhere anytime soon, they are going to have to adapt to today's IT, especially in the enterprise. New ideas and new ways of dealing with all this data coming from players like Fluency Security should be a welcome addition in the market. Solving this problem of data analytics should be something every company should be thinking about because it's so vital in this particular space of security. What do you think? Is the SIM dead? Are we in a post-SIM world? And if so, what's the future of it? Reach out to us at thesecuritychampions.com and let us know what you think. And we'll see you on the next episode.